Hello again, Jules fans. Welcome back to the latest episode of Jules in the Blood TV. It is Wednesday again, and quickly after the Easter weekend, it is another match preview show time as the big games keep coming. Unfortunately, this week, Jules will be heading to Valley Parade with their playoff dreams clinging probably by the merest of threads now. Looks like we're going to have to win all four games or at worst win three and draw the other to get into the top seven for the end of season lottery. But all the while there's hope, we will keep trekking up and down the country. I'm pleased to say that from the other end of said country is Chris, a Bradford City fan. I will put his details in the description at the bottom of the video, as I always do. So go and give him a follow on X. Chris, appreciate you coming on tonight, mate, to give us all the details about the Bantams. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to be a bit of a horror show. Uh, it's not been a season to... Uh to talk much about but I obviously fill you in on a few details of obviously what's been going on with Bradford in the season so far really yeah I mean it's fair to say if we look at, at recent form both sides are, are hardly in the best of nick at the moment if we look at um Gilles quickly because obviously a lot of Gilles fans watch this so they're going to know so it's just six points from the last 18 available for them that was one win at Morecambe by three goals to, goals to two a couple of Saturdays ago there's also been draws at home to Tranmere, Grimsby and Crewe there was a defeat at Wimbledon. And then, of course, there was that horror of a second half at Harrogate on Easter Monday where we managed to turn a 1-0 lead into a disgustingly bad 5-1 defeat. <laughs> uh, we currently sit ninth with 60 points from 42 games. Like I say, it is going to be tough now to get into the top seven. Other teams around us have games in hand. For Bradford, four points from the last 18. It does not make pretty reading at all. Forest Green at home, they lost 2-0. They then got absolutely battered by Mansfield by five goals to one at Valley Parade. Another home reverse at home to Notts County. That was three goals to nil. Then went and lost at Harrogate as well. Similar we to did. us by three goals to nil. But yeah, signs of, of, of life in the last couple though, Chris. A two nil home win against Tramere, who've been in decent form. And then a one all draw most recently at Grimsby Town. So a 15th position for Graham Alexander's men. 54 points from 41 games. So again, it is mathematically possible to gate crash the top seven, but I think we can both agree that neither of our sides are in good enough form to make that happen. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen with Bradford this season. Uh, the You know, the form in the last, I'd say, two, three months really hasn't been fantastic. Uh, we've both been on the hammering at Harrogate recently. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, um, it was a nice 2-0 victory against Tranmere a couple of weeks ago, Bobby Poynton, one of our own, scored an absolutely great goal. He's come back into the squad. Graham Alexander's not been a massive fan of him, to be honest with you, but he's he's shown highlights this season of what he's capable of. Um, and then Grimsby on, on Monday, which was a very poor game. In fact, to be honest with you, if I was a Grimsby fan, I'd be absolutely devastated that they didn't get uh, the, the three points in that one. It was, it was a very lacklustre performance, to be honest with you. Yeah, sounds similar to us. Like good win at Morecambe the other week. We we've obviously realised in the last few games that we've had to be more attacking, so we've ditched the back three and gone to a four-two-three-one yeah. to try and get more attacking players on the pitch. But it's left us more open defensively, Jules. And I do feel for Stephen Clements in this respect. We're stuck between a rock and hard place. We're we're not good enough defensively to play a back four. It doesn't look like. Um, obviously, after Monday afternoon. <laughs> Um, but we're not prolific enough to play a back three and two strikers. So so what do we do? It's trying to get the balance right. But even the, the game that we did win against Morgan, we gifted them to and their keeper gave us a massive helping hand. And I don't want to talk about Monday afternoon too much, but I've never seen a side implode. Uh, I, I, not just Gillingham, anywhere. To be that comfortable at 1-0 up at the break and thinking we're going to go on and win 2-3-0 here because they just offered absolutely nothing first half Harrogate. To yeah, it's crazy. Concede. I, I've got a, I work in Harrogate and I was talking to um, a couple of Harrogate fans yesterday actually and mm. they were saying at one nil down they said um, I thought that was going to be formality they said that the second half is one of the craziest halves of football they've ever seen and I think even for myself I think I saw the score at one nil I presume you were going to do it and then mm. just look back and see five one I just thought you know what on earth has happened there yeah no I'm still I mean you've probably seen a couple of my posts over the last couple of days it was. I don't know. I don't even know what to say about it. I still don't. Three days later, it was horrendous at best. But you, you can't be conceding five goals in half an hour at any level. Um, and if, if that's what nerves does to players, then we've got absolutely no chance of finding a way into the top seven. My only hope now is that the pressure is right off, essentially. So we just play with a bit of freedom. But we, we certainly can't repeat that because these players won't play for the club many more times if, if they're going to chuck in them performances as soon as the going gets a little bit tough. Um yeah, we've sort of, we've touched on obviously recent form. It's not good from both points of view. 
Uh, Bradford, somewhat surprisingly, I looked, are only 18th in the home table this year. Very, very poor from your own point of view. I know the pitch has come under a lot of scrutiny on, on social media throughout the campaign. Clearly doesn't help anyone. Um, but obviously you have to play on it 23 times, whereas we only have to come and do it once. So it's obviously been a hindrance. But aside from the fact that it resembles a beach rather than a football pitch at the moment, mate, is um, has the home form been somewhat surprising? Cause it's only seven wins, isn't it, in 21, I think, at home. I think if you look over the form of the last three years, the last three seasons, our home form has not been great. I think there's always that conversation of, which I, I'm not a fan of this conversation where, you know, everybody says it's their FA Cup when they come along to Bradford and they play up a little bit more. I, I won't take that. I don't accept that. And I, don't, I think that's ridiculous. Um, it, it's just been, it's just been dire. Um, I think, I, I don't think you can even blame the pitch, to be honest with you. The pitch is very heavy. I mean, obviously for the footballers themselves, if they're playing on it quite a lot, it's going to be a lot, you know, it's going to be a lot more difficult. There's also obviously, uh, you know, it, other teams have come across, come and come to Bradford and they've done really well. Um, it's just, it's just, it's not, you're just not quite sure what's going on. I think obviously as well, the fans are uh, hostile at the moment. I think we are pretty disappointed. You know, we've, probably start of the season we genuinely probably did have 15,000 in attendance obviously we we're getting abused for that because the attendances are probably roughly about seven or eight now including the away fans but that's just oh. because uh the fans are just disgruntled with what's going on at the club at the moment that is a big drop off here and I know and we all have banter on on social media and Twitter and the such we've you know, there's the, the laugh about obviously the two clubs was was Johnny Williams in the summer and absolutely um and then a lot of people laugh at Bradford because they, they talk about attendances and attendances don't win your points. Unfortunately, that's the trouble, isn't it? But it's um it's all done generally in jest. Um, but we've got to look at Graham Alexander. He was appointed in November, replaced Mark Hughes. Um, and I said at the time, I thought from an outsider's perspective, it looked a much better fit for Alexander and it looked a much better fit for Bradford City. Graham Alexander was at MK Dons who generally don't play that way. Mm. They want to get it down and keep it and pass it and pass it. Graham Alexander's always been slightly more direct and he's had success doing that at League Two and, and National League level. So I thought it was a really good appointment and it, it looked that way. I think it was um, only six defeats in the first 19 games, plenty of wins as well. And there was at one point, I think, turn of the year where you looked like you was going to sort of, you know, fly up the table and, and sort of certainly get in the top seven at worst. But it's it's obviously plateaued off and then dropped off the edge of a cliff in recent weeks because... Six weeks, six wins, six defeats, sorry, in 19 has turned into four defeats in the last six and only one win. What, what's, what's gone wrong there? Is it just the players are not good enough? I know you lost your keeper, Harry Lewis, who was very good for you um, in, in the January window. He stepped up and, and went to Carlisle, but ironically, he'll be back in League Two next season, it seems. <laughs> so that was a slightly strange move for me. Um, and that's no disrespect to Carlisle, but you'd say historically, in terms of infrastructure, fan base, stadium size pole Bradford are a much bigger attractive proposition than Carlisle so I didn't understand that move certainly given where Carlisle were in the league but that's his own choice but yeah what is it that's that's just gone so horribly wrong in the last month or so and, and is Graham Alexander still the man to take you into next season because he's he signed a, a fairly long-term contract yeah I, I mean I think to be honest with you I think the the this has been coming for a long time. I think the I think it, it goes a lot deeper than Graham Alexander. I think that um, the ownership of the club, um, for instance, our owner is Stefan Rupp. Uh, mm. Nobody ever hears from him until recently. Um, not really interested in the club. There's been a lot of bizarre decisions. Certainly in the summer, I would say that you know the players that we brought in are very very poor. I think you could see that on paper. We were. Um, you, for instance, a perfect example is players like Ash Taylor was coming in for two year deal. Ash is far, you know, he's past it. He, the only thing that he could do is throw a ball in. Um, you have to look at that, and and then it's kind of also the decisions of who's brought those players in. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't necessarily think it was it was particularly Mark Hughes who brought those players in. It was uh, Stephen Gent, who's the head of recruitment for for Bradford. And you look on it, and to be honest with you, even beginning of the season, I thought we're going to be in for a really, really difficult year. Obviously, Mark left. Um, probably was time for Mark to go. Graham's come in, but it hasn't. It, we've kind of had that little bit of a fix um, for a short term. It's now kind of looking like 
they, we need to get rid of it. A lot of players. I think Graham Alexander's decisions at times are very puzzling. Uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier on about Bobby Poynton, who is um, a very, very talented footballer, isn't getting anywhere near the first team or wasn't certainly until the last couple of games. I remember when I was talking to a friend of mine, in fact, Gab Sutton, uh, when, when Graham came in and he said, be very worried about Poynton because he said he doesn't like to bring youth players through, uh, which is which is shown. And obviously the the um, anger and the distress and um, has just culminated on the Bradford City fans having, you know, kicking off at the chairman, the owner, sorry. And what's happened with that? We had a protest at the last game. Don't believe there's going to be one on Saturday, so I don't think you need to worry too much. Um, but it's just about that the club at the moment is in just such a rut. I don't again, I don't like this thing of where people go because you're a bigger club or you, you you're a so-called bigger club, mm-hmm. you should be in a higher division. I think that's rubbish. I think you on the on paper, you know, if you're a well-run club and you run it, you know, on the pitch as well, that create success and I think the problem is for Bradford fans is we we haven't got that and we haven't had that we've had one um letter from Stefan Rupp in two years about what is going on with the club and what he expects to do we've had um I think if you've seen the news today David Sharp who used to be the Wigan chairman Dave Whelan's son um he's just come in as football operative I think is, is the term that he's got um I'm still still not quite sure what that role is um, but obviously, hopefully, that's going to be the start of something or hopefully, potentially, the club gets bought out by somebody who's actually interested in football and, and can push the club forward. Of course, yeah. And it, there seems to be similarities to us because obviously I think there was probably only a couple of days between Stephen Clements and Graham Alexander being appointed. So it's it's always difficult when you change manager mid-season. And, and again, both teams then have to change their approach because the new manager wants to come in, wants his own ideas. Um, I've said it a thousand times, so I won't go on about it too much, but I, I still don't understand the reasoning why we sat Neil Harris when we were four points off top in October, but that's that's been done a thousand times. Obviously, Bradford was a slightly different situation because you were, you were struggling in terms of where the club probably should have been in the table after last season where you was in the playoffs. Uh, um, let's talk about Stefan Rupp, though, because I think he took over in 2016 with... Is it Edin Rahic was his partner at the time, who's, who's since left the club um, for, for reasons that we're not going to discuss tonight. Um, but Rupp is still involved, as you say, he's, he's the owner. Um, made a big statement when he arrived seven years ago and said that he will get Premier League football back to Valley Parade within his lifetime. Now, I get that that's still achievable because the bloke's only in his 50s, I think. So he's, he's got plenty of time unless something very untoward happens. But... You're probably a lot further away from the Championship and the Premier League now than you was when he made the statement back in 2016, 2017. I think you was on the verge of getting out of League One into the Championship at the time. I think there was a, a playoff defeat to, to Millwall, if I recall Millwall, correctly. Yeah, that's right. Um, at, at Wembley. But obviously, since then, you've, you've slid back out of, of League One into to League Two and you're now in the wrong half. Um, so just as quickly as you can, I understand because there's a lot of deep-rooted feelings and, and frustration and anger and whatever you want to label it, Chris, towards the owner. Um, and I get that. We've, we've been there ourselves with, with Paul Scally over the last few years before the Gallantons come in and took over. But just if you can, as quickly as possible, just explain why Rupp is so vilified amongst the Bantams fan base. I think it's again, it's it's to do with the fact that he's not visible. We've not got any business plan. We don't know what the long term future is. We don't know what's in the two year, five year, seven year, ten year plan. We never have done. We've never really known that. Um, Ryan Sparks, who's the uh, CEO currently, was on BBC Radio Leeds, and basically the mandate that he had been set was to keep Bradford in the football league. It's, it's, it's kind of things like that. Um, Stefan's never been around. He's not a football man. He's a, a motorsports person. Um, and as I say, it's about the identity and knowing exactly what he is looking to achieve for Bradford fans. Mm-hmm. I feel like we've just been kind of left alone. I mean, for instance, Ryan Sparks was head of our media. Uh, when he first came in, there was a you know there was a reasonable amount of uh, explaining about what the club is what was going on with the club. Mm-hmm. We haven't heard anything. We've we've literally not heard anything for months and months and months. So when things have been going wrong, we haven't heard a thing, and it's frustrating because uh, your football club's everything. 
And when you're not getting uh, information from your owners, you're not being told what the plan is and what the future is. It's very unsettling, especially with the fact that the ground, uh, we we rent back the ground from um, Gordon Gibb, who is the Flamingo landowner. He bought it back in, like, it must be like 2002 when we were about to go bankrupt. Uh, mm-hmm. We do a 25-year lease and there's a potential to buy the ground. That's coming up soon. We've mm-hmm. never got any confirmation about what was happening with that. Um, but it's just, it's all kind of things like that. It's all about communication and also the fact that, like I say, being told that the, the, what the mandate is for the football club is to keep it in the football league, especially a club, again, I don't want to use the big big league term, but a club like Bradford who are just happy settling in League Two. Is well, just I'll say it because I know you feel uncomfortable saying it, but but Bradford are a football league club. Like, they shouldn't be in League Two for me in terms of, like we've already said, the things, the, the size of the club, the history, the fan base, the infrastructure. Although it's not great at the moment, it's all in place if you get it right to be top end league one, bottom half championship, I dare I say. Um, and I, I get your frustration. Things go wrong. We understand that as football fans, but at least be told why they're going wrong and what the plan is mm-hmm. to rectify them things. And, and I, again, I go back to, to Paul Scully um, in the latter years of his reign. Stuff was going wrong and he was blaming everybody but himself. It seems that there's a, another similarity with, with Rupp rather than coming out and blaming everyone. He's just gone completely into hiding and you know absolutely nothing about what's going on, which you can't do. It, I think... I mean, we've all had chats on social media about the fit and proper test, and I think it's an absolute car mm. crash, to be quite honest, and it needs ripping up and starting again um, because there has been too many football clubs. And for, for a club of, of Bradford's size and stature, for all the jokes and the banter that we see on social media, to be told as a fan that the plan is to just stay in the Football League, I can imagine, is just leaves a, a bit of taste in the mouth of all the fan base. Yeah, and absolutely is. And, you know, it's a case of, are we up for sale? Is anybody interested? I, I, I mean, from my understanding, I don't know if it's a fact, but uh, Stefan bought the club for around about five to ten million pounds when we were in League One. We were about to go up to the Championship. Mm-hmm. Well, fingers crossed we were. Obviously, we didn't get that. Um, and apparently still wanting the same kind of money. Um, which is bizarre to me why you would want that kind of money for... Um, why anybody would pay that kind of money for a League Two football club that doesn't own its own ground, doesn't own its own training facilities, and also trains at a school. Um, in fact, to tell you what, you might not have heard this one. How about this one? So there is, so there has been times where the players have been kicked off the school pitches because there was a lesson about to start. I mean, it's that it's that whole kind of you know you, we you mentioned about infrastructure, and I'm thinking, well, actually, to be honest with you, bar um, you know, bar the fans and the club, the club's name, we don't really have any assets whatsoever. And it's, you know, it's little things like this that you just kind of go, what is going on? What is the plan for the future? Mm. I understand it's a difficult climate these days. I'm not saying that we expect to have a billionaire come in and spend 500 million quid and build us this uh, state of an art bill, uh, stadium or you know training facilities. But at least just be kept in the loop. We, we all yeah. understand as fans there's stuff that, that can be told and stuff that can't be told and, and that's absolutely fine but to, to be getting absolutely nothing and I suppose you could probably you'd swallow it a bit more if your club was actually doing alright on the pitch as well but to have everything in the background and then the fact that the football's not great you're not winning enough football matches it, like I say it all just it's just a snowball effect isn't it for all the wrong reasons. Absolutely, and uh, and that's what big brings anger, it brings frustration, and it brings heartache. The the amount of uh, Bradford fans that I've talked to this season who are de- genuinely walking away from the club because they just they just don't know what's going on. I mean, the one great thing is there's the Bradford um, Independent Supporters uh, Trust that have come on board done some amazing things. Uh, Steve Hamilton, for instance, has, has been trying to get hold of the club. Another thing we did with Rupp was um, there was around 500, 600 signatures on um, a recorded um, delivery to Stefan in Germany. Stefan decided he didn't want to accept it and rejected it, wouldn't open it, wouldn't have anything to do with it, uh, which is what I, I mean, I would say if he's rejecting it. Uh, and eventually what, that, what came from that was that we needed to create uh, there was a protest that, that was at the ground to say we want, you know, both Stefan and uh, Ryan Sparks out of the club. Mm-hmm. Uh, from that, that is when we finally get the day before a letter from Stefan Rupp for the first time in two years. You ask yourself, why? Why the timing? Why why now? I mean, it's great that we've had that information from yourself. But why now? 
you you know it's it's little things like this and um it's just a very very difficult time to be a Bradford fan at the moment it's just not it's it's not fun and it's not exciting and it's just depressing and I think we've all got to the point where even on Twitter I'll see other clubs ripping Bradford and we'll just say you know what you're absolutely right and it's it, it, I can't remember who it was I think it was Forest Green we got beat by 2-0 and they mm -hmm. were coming out hammering us on Twitter and we were just going yeah no yeah we are terrible you're absolutely right you know it, it, it's that kind of thing where you know the identity even you know, the fans are just so frustrated so sick and tired of what's going on that we just going can't even be bothered Harrogate when I come back from Harrogate I was just like I wasn't even fussed and it's that's we just were like that the, releg the relegation season out of out of League One a couple of years ago and then the first half of last season and, and I think it's a it's a slippery slope when apathy sets in amongst the fan base because yeah that's only a reflection of what's going on within the football club. And if there's apathy within the football club and then the fans start feeling like that way, then it becomes very hard to turn it around. Thankfully, we have slowly and steadily rather than spectacularly, I'd say, and, and, and fingers crossed from your point of view that, that it does get sorted out sooner rather than later. But let's, let's just get back to Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I, I really appreciate all the details on, on, on why the fan base feels as it does at the moment. And, and I genuinely do feel for you because there's there's too many sets of supporters that, that up and down the country get stitched up. Um, and we don't want to see another situation where we see like South Ends and, and that type of thing and Scunthorpe's and there's too many to mention, isn't there? Yeah. Macclesfield, unfortunately. Um, there is a game Saturday. We've, mm. we've gone off on a bit of a tangent, which we is are, fine. I um, no, not at all. Not at all. That's why we get you on, because, and that's why I asked the question, because I think it's important that the story gets out there for, for everyone to see as well. Um, Andy Cook, again, has, has been the main man this season, and I guess it would be an even more depressing season if it wasn't for Andy Cook's numbers, because I was looking today, Chris, he scored 15 and he's assisted five in the league this season. That equates to 41% of your goals in the league that he's been involved in. Just, Just... Just how good, I know how good he is because he tortured us a couple of times in recent years. Um, I, I guess it probably doesn't even bear thinking about, about where you'd be if, if Andy Cook wasn't available for most of the season. I'm just looking at your line-up from Grimsby, actually, and he, he wasn't in the squad. Is he injured? or he's, he's got a slight injury. So he, was, he was missing the uh, the game before as well against Trump. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, Andy Cook speaks for himself. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He's got his own critics, believe it or not. Um, I think a lot of sometimes people think he's a bit lazy. Um, I mean, personally, when you look at the, his goal scoring record, and certainly for us, I don't think you can knock the guy. Um, fantastic footballer. When when the ball is played to him, I think he's he's usually going to score a goal. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he's a great player. We've just really struggled with finding somebody up front to, to play with him. We've had Tyler Smith, who we got in from Hull in the summer, mm -hmm. uh, hasn't really done anything bar in the uh, Mickey Mouse Cup. Um, he's I think he's scored about eight or nine goals, Tyler has, but he's really, really struggled recently. And obviously, Jake Young um, came back from Swindon. Obviously, he was firing on all cylinders for Swindon, came back, got injured, he's out for the rest of the season. I did look at that because I looked at his numbers and I was like, oh, there's another 20 goal contribution. And I thought, oh, they're all for Swindon. There's nothing, nothing apart from an injury nothing. since. And I thought that just sums up Bradford's campaign, unfortunately. This is it. This is it. Absolutely. I think he played maybe three times for his, uh, it looked decent when he came, you know, when he played. Um, but obviously he's got injured. He's out for the season. I'm sure he's absolutely devastated that he left Swindon. And to be honest with you, who would blame him? Uh, but you've got kind of like, uh, I think apart from that, you've got Smallwood in the middle. Um, Terrible on set pieces. Uh, I think when we when we look at Smallwood when we signed him last summer, summer before, sorry, uh, championship captain for Hull. You're kind of thinking that's the kind of statement. That's a marquee signing. Mm -hmm. Don't think it's really lived up to. Um, yes, yeah, I think there was all the sort of debate around who was the best signing when it? it was either Smallwood and I think Leighton Orient signed George Moncur both out of the championship right. at the time and there was like a bit of to and fro in between the two fan bases and I think Smallwood scored against us didn't he last season if he did in the 2 nil win at our place in February I'm sure he did and then Andy Cook scored a good goal as well yeah yeah and uh, he's a very frustrating footballer um I think he's a very frustrated playing in the in the, the team at the moment as well anyway I mean like I say he's is he Mr. Reliable? I don't know. Um, is he a captain for the championship? No, I think he's probably goes down as a D for me. I think um, he's he's not really 
been there. Um, you've got Alex Gilly- Gilliard in the middle, who's been with us for about three years now, but he's had a few different stints at the club. Um, runs his heart out. I'm not entirely sure that that's always great. Uh, doesn't always, I think last season, he only had one assist and no goals. Got himself a new contract this summer. Uh and got it for two years. And then you've got kind of, we've we've had a mix of different players around. But I think the player to probably look out for Jill's fans um, is uh, Brad Halliday. Um, fantastic player. We call him the Ginger Cafu. Uh, loves running down the wing, uh, putting in balls in the cross, and crosses in. So, so we used to have a Ginger Cafu. Stuart <laughs> Lewis. I'm sure we did. Yeah. I, I we might, think have, to, we might have to copyright like that, Jill's fans. <laughs> <laughs> I think every club's probably had one, mate. I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, Halliday's really good. You mentioned earlier on as well about uh, losing Harry Lewis. Um, to be honest, we brought in Sam Walker from Charlton. Hasn't mm. really played around. It hasn't played much for the last two or three years. He's been fantastic. Mm. Um, certainly a, a great signing. Colin Doyle, who's our um, reserve goalkeeper, brought yeah. him in apparently. Um, Sam's been absolutely Mr. Consistent. There's been games, for instance, Mansfield could have been 8-9-1. Um, Notts County could have been 5-6-0 if it wasn't for Sam. Um, and I think that I'm yet to see... Oh, I can't tempt fate. I'm going to do it, aren't I? I haven't it. seen him yet make a big mistake. So um, I think that he's reliable. <laughs> he's he's reliable. And to be honest with you, uh, all the best to, to Harry. But I do think he's an upgrade on, on, on Harry. And that's not me being negative because he's left us. No. I just think that he brings a little bit more calmness. Um the defence know kind of what they're doing. Harry's not had a great year, to be honest. He made plenty of mistakes before he left for Carlisle. Mm-hmm. I think that's been the case for him as uh, for Carlisle as well. I think okay. Bradford fans seem to be joining that, which is a shame because he's a great guy and he was, you know, he a, a great um, advocate for the club. Did a lot of stuff, for, you know, for the charity and, uh, charities and things like that. Um, so it's a shame because I'd really like to see him push on and hopefully go a higher up the leagues not back into League Two next season, which is obviously where he's gone. Yeah, it looks like it. So just quickly then in terms of um lineups, do, do you think there's going to be many changes from, from Easter Monday or are we expecting Cook to be fit or at least on the bench or do you think it's going to be pretty much the same eleven? I have to be honest, it's been very quiet about why Cook's, uh, Cook's gone. I'm not trying to be uh, create some rumours here, but um, I... Uh, Graham Alexander alluded to that there was potentially a couple of um, knocks and obviously he missed last weekend. I think if he's fit, obviously he starts. Uh, yes, you know, there's, yeah. there's no there's no um, case of that. I think uh, obviously we would have um, Kyan Kelly in the back, who's an Irish centre mm-hmm. back. Um, I think you're probably talking Matty Platt. Uh, Ayagoki we've got from Brentford, who is not the greatest. Um, Tyreek Wright, I think, might play as well. Um, yeah, I th- I don't think there'll be many changes. I think he'll probably keep the like, same lineup. However, he does like to potter around a little bit, does Graham Alexander. So I, I would not be surprised to see a totally different team against on Saturday. So he does like to keep a few surprises. And usually they're surprises to Bradford fans as well because they're not quite sure why he's playing that kind of football or Fair putting that, that team together, should I say. Bit of a selection bingo then to look forward to at the <laughs> yeah. weekend. In terms of the deals, I think it's just going to be Dom Jeffries and, and Jorge Atado still unavailable due into injury and unless anything came out of Monday. I know Stephen Clements did cancel the time off after the uh, the collapse in the second period. So I'm not sure how we're going to play it, to be honest. I think we've got to try and be on the front foot because we need to win football matches to get in the top seven. So, but then that leaves us too open if we play a back four. So I've made, I would make a couple of changes um, I'd, I'd, I'd obviously I'd stick with Glenn Morris in goal because he's very good. I'd go Romeo Hutton, Maxima, Shadogi in for Connor Masterson and Max Clark. That would be my back four. I'd then remove Timmy Dieng and play Robbie McKenzie with Ethan Coleman so that we've got two defensive-minded midfielders. And then I would leave the front quartet of Connor Mahoney, George Lapsley, Johnny Williams. Oh, and I'd actually make one more change. I'd start Josh Andrews this week instead of Ollie Hawkins if he's fit. Um, I just think he's a bit more mobile. And I'd just say, right, them two in front, sit and protect and just let that front four go and try and create enough chances for us to win the football match. Whether Stephen Clements decides to go with that, I'm, I'm convinced he won't <laughs> because if he's watching us and picking the team, then we've got real problems. <laughs> um, 
and the bench will probably be similar to, to, to what it has been in recent weeks. He's, he's, he's been loyal to, to a 17, 18, 19 people, depending on, on who's unavailable, suspensions and that type of thing. Final question, Chris, before I let you go and get ready to go out, is the dreaded score prediction? Uh, I'm going to be completely honest there. Yeah? I think 3-0 Jills. 3 Wait a minute. Don't adjust your sets, Jills fans. You just backed us to score three goals, which we've only done twice this season, I think. Three I, times just, this season. Yeah, I, I'm going to go with 3-0, Jills, and uh, I'm probably going to get a few pelters for that, but I just think that we will really struggle on Saturday. I hope you're right. I'm not going to lie, because that gives <laughs> us a real boost going into the final trio of games. I'm still not sure how it's going to play. I can't see it being a draw, because I think we've got to be open to just try and get the three points. And so I put down, I thought it would go one goal either way and I backed us to win by two goals to one. But I'll take yours because it's a lot more comfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As Mate, I said, really... I'll, I'll get some pelters for that, but I, it's just the way that I think, you you know, you're, you're front four. I do actually think that you will score quite a few against this. Fingers crossed, because we've created plenty in recent weeks. That's one thing that Stephen Clements has improved. It's just been the ability to actually take them chances has still been the problem, which is holding us back. Chris, it's been a real pleasure, mate. I really appreciate your time, so thank you very much. Jules fans, Bradford fans, if you're still watching at this point, please consider pressing that like button and please consider pressing that subscribe button. Do not forget, there will be a prize giveaway in the summer as we pass 3,000 subscribers, and that is open to fans of all clubs. So keep your eye on your social media during the off-season. As I say, Chris's details are in the description. Go and give him a follow. Myself and Ava are on the coach with Nick very early on Saturday morning. We must be mad. This was booked before Harrogate, to be fair. And I'm tight <laughs> and I'm not going to waste money. <laughs> so we will be at Valley Parade for a match day live at the weekend. But until then, enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks again to Chris and up the Jills. <laughs>